All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming to this uh, PST Science Collaborations uh, meeting. It's now uh, just gone uh, 2.05 p.m. Pacific time, Wednesday, October the 18th, uh, 2023. Uh, I'll just say a couple of words and share the agenda, then we'll move into the actual discussion um, as, uh, as we go through here. So where is my Zoom window? Uh, Okay, let's have a look. Um, yes, here we go. All right, so I think everyone I see here has signed them in already to the to the to the present attendance thing. That's good. Um, the agenda I have for today is um, is um, uh, the following. Uh, Steve and Jelka have very kindly offered to provide a short Q and A session uh, on the schedule update email that went round. Um, sent up by Victor Cravendam um, on the 17th, that's just yesterday, as we have this meeting. Uh, for those who might not be on the relevant mailing list, um, I've pasted that email to the end of the agenda live notes document. So we all have that to refer to um, should we need it. And I understand Steve will say a few words before we do that. Um, the main body of the meeting after that will then by the schedule be discussion about difference imaging. Uh, Eric Bellum has very kindly uh, prepared a presentation uh, and we'll have some discussion after that and then we'll, we'll see where we go. Uh, so I think that's everything I had. Um, before we do launch into the schedule update, um, are there any questions or comments anybody wants to raise before we start in on this? All right, I don't think I see any. Um, I realize I've not asked for a volunteer to take notes, but um, I can take that on for today. If anybody wants to help me, you're welcome to. Uh, otherwise, I will I will take notes as we go through this. And uh, with that, I think I'll stop sharing and uh, hand it over to Steve, if you're ready, Steve. Great, thanks. Yeah, I just, it seemed to me since uh, this meeting was happening and the notice just went out, it would be good to take a little time here um, just as a reminder, just recall about a year ago, um, as we saw how all the pieces were coming together for the project, we realized that, uh, and we get together at least quarterly as a project to uh, re-optimize given um, that not all of the pieces come together exactly uh, as uh, originally planned. Um, but in order to get to the earliest and best science. Um, uh, recall about a year ago, it was clear that removing the on-sky data taking time for ComCam in favor of just putting the LSST camera, the big camera on sky, um, because it was going to be available as needed in the sequence uh, made sense. Um, but we always said it was there um, uh, if, uh, if, events conspired to uh, make it useful. And um, I will just say that, uh, and you'll hear more from Joko and Aaron may want to say a couple of words about the camera status, that it um, is clear that in a re-optimization, it's a good idea to put ComCam back on Sky, uh, particularly for uh, for commissioning the telescope and there with the main focus is on uh, the uh, active optic system. Um, I just wanna, and the reason I asked to just talk here is I want, I hope everyone understands, we really want the community to know as soon as we know. We try to get these notices out right away, um, uh, even when we don't have every last I dotted and T crossed because we want to share with people, they know what's going on. And then as we understand things further, of course, we'll give updates. The best place to look is ls.st slash dates. Um, and um, I, let me turn it over to Jalco. Schedule update. So nothing much changed. The schedule forecast is still the same we think will be done in about two years from now. That didn't change, but it did slide. The zero point change, unfortunately. So there were a number of unplanned events, both at the summit and with LSST cam at Slack. 
So there are two main sets of activities. At the summit, we need to complete TMA. We need to integrate optics with the TMA, which includes coating of M1, M3, et cetera. So our summit integration team believes that they could have TMA ready with integrated optics by July of next year, July of 24. If we had LSST cam ready, then it would go on the telescope in July. So that's about nine months from now. But unfortunately, we don't think we will have LSST cam at the summit by that time. There is a problem with vacuum leak, and there is a bit of good news that the leak was plugged last Friday, I believe. So far, the vacuum is holding up. There were some additional tests with the second phase of that fix with adding epoxy that tests are not giving us clear answer that we should go and apply epoxy as a second step. So there, there are more details to it. At this moment, it's moving in the right direction, but we are not out of the woods yet. Assuming that it will go as planned and that very soon we will commence the last five phase of EO testing, we are planning to fix the shipment date in February of next year. And at this moment, it seems that we could ship the camera in March to the summit, and it would be ready to go on TMA in October of 24. Now, you remember I said TMA will be ready in July, and that opens a window of about two to three months where there is a good chance that ComCam would go back onto the TMA and we would get some on-sky engineering data and decision whether we will do that or not will be made in January or around January of the next year. That of course will be dependent on what, whether we stick to the existing plan on the summit as well as the camera team confirming that they fix the leak. That's where we stand. So if everything goes according to the current plan, then we would have system first light with LSSD cam in January of 25. And we think that operations readiness review could happen in late May or June of 25. And hopefully before the end of calendar year 25, we would have operations and LSSD going on. That's where we stand right now. The main risks are, of course, that things on the summit do not progress as well. Our team, integration team, says they are rather confident in the plan as it is. So we are talking about nine months. Historically, we were moving at 80%. So if you add 20% on it, you get maybe two months more. So in this case, we'd lose ComCam on Sky if LSSD cam arrives on time. But the other risk is that we are going to successfully accomplish that fix of the vacuum leak and that everything will go well with your testing and that we will actually ship the camera in March. So these are all risks that we have. It's hard to predict future, as you know. So this is, I told you everything that we know and there is nothing that I held back. So back to you, Steve. No, I think that's it. Um, let's, I think, open the floor for questions. Um, I can start with one, um, what people are thinking. Um, thanks, Joka, that's great. So um, in, in terms of what dates people who are working on NSF proposals or follow-up proposals might put down for when LSST main operations can start, um, it sounds like the, the number we should now use is what December 2025 do I hear that right late 25 so optimistically it could happen as early as June of 25 for for LSST start I don't think it can happen before June of 25 I'm hopeful it will happen by the end of 25 
but that's the range. So I, we can't be more precise than that. We do understand it's it's a problem when you have to write proposal. We write them ourselves, but that's the best we can do at this time. All these dates are not earlier than. All are not earlier than. Okay, that's consistent with um, what we've been hearing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I see Meg's hand is up. I guess my question is, is how much of the camera status can be made public and when? Obviously, you're testing things, but some people, at least in my collaboration, are wondering, should I put in a proposal if it's really a year delay? Because we kind of heard at LSS2 at year five, at least publicly, of like, well, we don't know what's going on with the camera. So it could be this, it could be that, right? And so I'm just wondering is if, as you said, there's been progress of actually there's been an attempt to plug, right? Where there was talk of, we might have to rip the whole camera apart. I know that necessarily um, isn't um, right. Or like the discussions uh, of that. So just wondering is, is there plans to update the community in some way? Of course. That people were debating about this because I think some people are like, oh, they're still assessing, right? It'll take months before they they do something because obviously this is serious, but it sounds like there's been a lot of uh, progress right now. I'm just wondering how much can we say or is there some way you'll give an update at some this point? All, for people? This, this discussion is 100% public. It's being recorded and it will be posted, number one. Maybe Joko or Aaron, Aaron would you like to say a couple words on yeah. this? Let me, yeah, let me step in. So I mean, Joko gave the Highline summary and... Um, uh, it is true in our discussions of this, we have, uh, you know, we have identified that if we could not patch this vacuum leak in place and we needed to disassemble, you know, it's not the whole camera, it's the utility trunk, that's the back cylinder that has all the support equipment. That would be a very substantial deal. Um, okay, so we're, we're not in that situation today. So we... We have, uh, we had a um, extensive uh, meeting, so not a review, but we, we classified it as a notice to proceed meeting, which is a method we use when we have sort of consequential activities with hazards or risks. So we conducted that last week um, with, a, with a, a panel of you know, engineering experts around Ruben and here at SLAM uh, with our plans. And that, you know, that committee didn't have any, um, you know, had some good advice, uh, did not point to any showstopper. So we made a decision to proceed with the first part of our remediation plan. And that was to plug the leak with a low viscosity epoxy. So that, we did that uh, on Friday and that was successful. So right now there is no leak. Um, we, have a, we have a second step that we were going to take to apply uh, a different epoxy and a conformal coating. So sort of coating the full region of this flange as a risk reduction step to prevent any future leaks. And at the same time, we were conducting tests on a sample flange, so not part of the gamut, but a duplicate of this feature that we built. And that testing indicated a problem with the second step. So at this point, we are going to proceed cautiously um, uh, both, both on the camera and with further testing. So now in terms of more public statements, you know, we, there is the monthly, uh, monthly message uh, from the observatory to the full community. And I would say um, that, you know, for the next one of those, we can mention, uh, uh, you know, the progress that we have at the time that's appropriate. You know, we are we are still hoping to restart the fi this final testing period. And if that's restarted, we can certainly update the community about that. Okay. So it's a, it is a complicated story. Um, uh, so, you know, one difficult to kind of encapsulate in a, in a single state. But that that is the status as of today. I hope that's helpful. And, and I want yeah, to that's, say, that's and very helpful. Thank no, you. no, there are no secrets about the camera status. I don't think there is. I think it's that the information's coming out in ways that aren't written down. It's so if you weren't at LSST, if you're at five, you're hearing it from people that were there, and then the message that came out today, so or yesterday. So I think it's just um, 
that the new latest right of how you'll communicate that so if it's going to be in a digest in early november i think that's great yeah i think i i you know i would like to use the digest which would you know have a, a briefer version than what i just mentioned and whatever status is appropriate i think that's something we can certainly do i will add this is why we also use ls.st slash dates so that we don't have to do a sort of, well, at this meeting, we heard this, at this meeting, we heard that. Everybody has the same source. Um, that If you tie everything at one place, it um, tends to reduce ground loops. So those are the two places to look. Steve, can you remind us how often LSS, LSS slash dates is updated? Monthly. Monthly. M monthly, okay, thank you. It's triggered by our agency reports that are sent monthly. And it's not exactly monthly because sometimes some budgetary information gets stuck in the process. So sometimes it's delayed by a week or two. So until agency report goes out, we do not update those LSST dates because they have to find out first. But then one hour afterwards, we update the website. Yes, and that sense is, is official because it's what the agency has been told. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. And then when there's a big change or strategy change or something like that, then the project issues uh, communicate like the one Victor sent out yesterday. Okay, well, thanks very much. I know we need to get on to Eric's uh, talk. If there are any other questions or concerns, though, we definitely would appreciate hearing them. Thanks. And just to comment, if people do have questions after this discussion, um, you can enter them into the agenda live notes here or just send them, I suppose, to, you know, I guess, myself or Steve would we'll get them. And there is an announcement that I think came out yesterday that has summary of the schedule workshop and those dates I mentioned. Is that the email by Victor? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we have that. And actually, for those in the meeting, that's pasted in this document as well, at the end of the agenda for this meeting. So we will have access to that. But yeah, thanks for the reminder. Okay, um, before we do move on then, um, are there any questions or comments on this issue um, before we, we let Eric um, explain about difference imaging? I see Graham, your hands up. Hi, Will. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry if I missed it, and um, one of you said it very clearly already. Is it clear today um, at what point you'll know whether the um, whether the leak problem is more significant and would require more, you know, more extensive opening the instrument up and and therefore bigger delay? Is there a, a clear time scale on which? You'll have a yes, no on that. Aaron, do you want to take this one? No. Um, it's actually a difficult question to answer. Uh, I think, um, you know, we're, we're on track, you know, assuming that the leak stays plugged, which is the current situation, we are on track for a shipment, as Jacques mentioned, late March. So I would say certainly, you know, inside that time period, uh, if, if things didn't develop, if things developed in a negative way, uh, we concluded that we had to take this more extreme action. It would be in this sort of time frame. So I would say it's, you know, it's in the next several months. Thanks. Appreciate it. It's a hard question to answer. It is, actually. Yeah. No, thanks for your candor. Thank you. Okay. Um, last chance for any questions on this issue in this meeting. Okay. Um, thanks all. Um, in that case, I'll move on to the, uh, the difference imaging discussion. Uh, so Eric has very kindly offered to uh, to tell us about difference imaging. Um, Eric, you should be able to share screen now, so uh, your slides should should project onto. Should we just make sure it works? That looked good. 
That looks good, thank you. All right, uh, and are we trying to finish at the top of the hour, Will? That'll go. Um, I'd like to finish. I'd like to finish at five till if we can to give people a chance right. to move on to whatever they're doing next. But we'll see how we go. The discussion often ends up expanding past the time we give it. In, indeed. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Eric Bellum. I'm the science lead for alert production uh, for Ruben. Uh, I was asked to come and report on uh, status of image differencing. Um, and so I have um, kind of a broad uh, outline here of topics. And uh, I guess I would encourage folks to jump in uh, if they are interested with questions, because I suspect there's more material here than we'll cover in 30 minutes. Um, there are, um, so I'll talk about algorithms and data sets and metrics and some of our progress on completeness and machine learning uh, scoring of uh, different image sources. Uh, there was some interest in crowded field processing. Uh, and I can talk a little bit about, about uh, what we're doing with Oxtel and in commissioning. Uh, I don't plan to talk about streak masking, uh, alert latency or execution time template generation or alert distribution, but if those are topics of particular interest, we can circle back to them. Um, so I will go ahead and dive in here, uh, move maybe a little quickly, but again, um, I hope folks will jump in with questions uh, on the parts that are of particular interest. Uh, I do wanna start by acknowledging that uh, alert production is part of the larger data management team. Uh, and there are contributions uh, from a, a huge range of individuals, uh, many of whom you see here in this picture from our visit to Chile earlier this year. Uh, I haven't tried to credit you know, individual pieces of this presentation to specific people because it is really a very much a team effort, but uh, certainly uh, if there are uh, problems of direction or execution, uh, the, I will take responsibility for those. So. All right, uh, with that said, let me dive into image differencing algorithms. Um, so I, I think I can go past here with this audience. Um, you know, the idea of image differencing is to find things that are changing, do it quickly, uh, you know, get rid of background sources and galaxies and crowding, uh, and then uh, do so efficiently. Uh, and so this is a technique with a storied history in astronomy and we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, the challenge, of course, as we know from the ground, is that uh, you know the PSF is changing. Uh, some of the naive things you might think about, uh, you know, sort of matching the, you know, just uh, convolving with the uh, uh, the worst seeing image, you you run into trouble because you need to know the PSF very quick, clearly, uh, and there's some numerical issues that come up. So, uh, Allard and Lupton, of course, back in the '90s, uh, made the proposal to. Uh, represent the convolution kernel as a sum of a uh, set of basis functions uh, and then solve for those in a least square sense. Uh, this is optimal when the template uh, has enough images in it that it is uh, noise free or close enough and that you have better seeing in the science than in the template. Uh, and you can uh, allow your basis functions to vary over the image, uh, which allows for uh, the PSF to change effectively through the image. So. Um, in, uh, in the last few years, um, there's been a little bit of resurgence in interest in image differencing. Uh, there was a paper by Zake Ofek and Gal Yam, widely called Zogi, uh, that proposed a Fourier space implementation of image differencing uh, with the major um, sort of um, uh, advantage here that uh, it's um, more effective and more optimal uh, when the template is not noise free. Uh, it's also fully symmetric uh, between the two images that you're subtracting, uh, but you have to know the PSFs. Uh, Re-inspired by this, uh, uh, David Reese and, and Robert uh, uh, recognized that you could use the same sort of noise whitening ideas within the Allard and Lupton framework, uh, and so wrote up a tech note, uh, which you see here. Uh, and so, um, have all the advantages of noise whitening and getting your detection thresholds right uh, without requiring you to know the PSFs exactly. Uh, so this was demonstrated uh, again some years ago. Um, and so, you know, in thinking about the trade-offs between these, these two algorithms, um, the major, I would say, advantages of, of, of Zogi is it's, you know, fully symmetric between your two images. Uh, and if you have misaligned PSFs, it will handle those nicely. 
but the worry is that because you have to know the PSF very well or the ratio, uh, there's concern that it will not perform as well in crowded fields. And empirically, you know, um, you know, working in Fourier space, you start to see issues with uh, all the real effects uh, in real images in terms of uh, gaps and edges and interpolations and so on. So um, most of our effort and the project to date has been focused on what we're calling the decorrelated Allard and Lupton. Uh, and the major challenge there is in terms of um, uh, understanding what to do when the science image has better seeing than the template. Uh, however, again, there is a, a proposal or, or a, an, an algorithmic approach here, which uh, we believe works, which is to pre-convolve uh, the science image by its, uh, by its PSF. Uh, it, that works in a certain range of seeing. Uh, but when you do that, uh, the, then plugging that through the sort of a Lard and Lupton framework uh, gives you at the end, not a difference image, but directly the likelihood image that you detect on. So it requires a little bit of different book bookkeeping, but uh, the overall uh, effect is quite similar. Um, so we have been using this and, and uh, working with this in science pipelines and uh, believe that we now have an implementation that uh, has reasonable for performance. This uh, cutout on the, on the right is a um, uh, pre-convolved image where, again, the science image has slightly better seeing than the template. Uh, there is clearly still uh, an artifact kind of dipole situation in the lower left, uh, but I would say that overall it's a very clean subtraction um, and a good sign. So uh, I think we have a fair bit uh, more work to do here uh, to convince ourselves that this is the solution, um, but I think overall uh, we feel pretty confident that um, this decorrelated approach uh, will be successful. Will, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um... Does this all require that the template and the science image both use the same camera? Or could one imagine using uh, Im a template image from a different camera with better seeing or now a PSF, how we define that um, to, 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 to do this? I think it's you still require the same camera in both cases. Yeah, I, I think you could do that. That's not something we're expecting to pursue in Ruben. Um, okay. for kind of a wide variety of reasons. But yeah, I think there's, yeah. you know, pe people do uh, different imaging against other surveys with some frequency in the real world, but uh, it's not uh, a data management project that we're planning. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You would need to match the pass bands as well, Will. Uh, yeah, quite precisely, I imagine. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions on this section? I'm going to keep keep buzzing through. All right. Uh, I want to talk very briefly about uh, how we do our testing with precursor data sets. Obviously, we don't have LSST CAM yet. Um, we use a variety of uh, real and simulated data uh, from dark energy camera, hyper supreme cam, uh, the desk DC2 image simulations, and now also uh, Oxtel Lattice. Um, you know, these have different advantages and disadvantages in terms of uh, camera characteristics and depth and, um, you know, scale and so on. Um, but, you know, looking at the effects of processing on real data has really been invaluable in uh, giving us, uh, you know, all the, all the real effects that we see in real cameras. Uh, we run sort of at two timescales. We have a number of what we call CI or continuous integration data sets that are just a few images uh, from each of these sets of cameras. Those run in an automated uh, form nightly. Uh, we have a variety of sort of fairly coarse metrics that are computed. And then uh, we can look for regressions and other changes in uh, object counts and runtime and so on. And uh, this has been quite helpful in catching um, pipeline issues that might have been unanticipated uh, and uh, gives us, an, you know, helps us keep an eye on the evolving pipeline performance. Uh, the other sort of scale we run at is, is monthly. Uh, we have larger subsets of these data, for, again, from the different cameras uh, that we run in, in batch mode on, uh, you know, USDF resources at Slack you know, taking sort of a, a day or two to sort of process, you know, hundreds of hundreds of visits and full focal planes and so on. Uh, and then we take those and uh, look at their outputs and dig in and identify 
problems uh, and so on. So, and of course there's, there's also intermediate scale, you know, hypothesis driven testing where we, we tweak configurations and compare what happens and so on. But uh, the tent poles again are sort of the nightly small processing and then the monthly regular reprocessing. Uh, in terms of metrics, uh, I would say to date, I, I, I have not been, <laughs> we have not implemented uh, metrics that I think are good enough yet. Um, we've used kind of some rough proxies uh, for uh, different image quality to try to assess proportions of artifacts and so on um, and look at, you know, the completeness of uh, injected fakes and so on. Uh, and these certainly help us identify some issues, but I don't think they really have gotten us close enough yet to where we need to be. Uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit later about some, uh, some of where we're going next, um, but they have given us at least some leverage on uh, you know, how the pipeline is doing and allowed us to find and fix, fix problems. Um, you know, at some level, the, the biggest challenge is that um, a lot of what we would like to do is uh, human labeling, you know, identifying artifacts, you know, putting eyes on the pixels is, I think, one of the most useful, useful things. And that's unfortunately just labor intensive. Um, this is a March 2020, uh, which is a consequential uh, time period, if you can recall, a uh, plot of um, we sort of uh, went through and labeled a few thousand well, maybe not even that many, um, um, maybe a few hundred uh, cutouts uh, with various uh, effects and identified sort of the uh, proportions of various kinds of failures. Uh, and, you know, we uh, candidly haven't redone this specific exercise since then. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think that highlights both uh, the need for eyes on data and, and also just the, the fact that it's, it, it takes time. Um, what we're focusing on at the moment is um, uh, migrating some metrics into um, what's called analysis tools, uh, which is a package that the uh, DRP team has built and use. Uh, these are some of their example plots, which are extremely data rich, uh, which they use to guide their larger scale data release processing. Uh, and this is a framework that uh, produces metrics and plots uh, sort of as a built-in pipeline component and it has a number of nice features. Uh, and so we are migrating some of our uh, old metrics and, and developing new ones uh, with an eye to making use of this. And then uh, one of the major advantages then is that we can share uh, metrics code between uh, difference imaging analysis in data release production as well as in alert production. Uh, there's also some nice tooling that comes along with this. On the right, of course, you you know you see again the time series of metrics, which uh, is similar to what I showed earlier. Uh, on the left, uh, there's something called the plot navigator, uh, which automatically populates um, the gender generated plots uh, that are available through the Butler um, uh, in the USDF, and so. It may, provides a convenient sort of web interface uh, that is, you know, populated with uh, everyone's collections of, uh, of analysis tools, plots, uh, and we just generated in AP our, our first set uh, in a sprint uh, a week or so ago, and are looking forward to figuring out how to make, uh, make better use of this capability. All right, let's talk about completeness. Um, so the way we want to assess uh, uh, fake source uh, uh, completeness is through injecting fake sources uh, or synthetic sources, if you prefer that terminology. Uh, we've had some rough capability to do this since uh, again about 2020, uh, and it's been running in the pipelines uh, since then. And we track it again in our nightly metrics and, is, and look at it in the larger uh, larger runs. Uh, we've recently brought on board a new hire, uh, Bruno Sanchez, who is looking at this in much more detail and has sort of recharacterized how we how we think about it. Uh, so this is uh, an HSC run from uh, just uh, this this last month, looking at the efficiency as a function of the uh, truth signal to noise. And so the sort of sigmoid curve you get here is uh, what you would expect from. Uh, just sort of, you know, uh, integrating the Gaussian probability. Uh, and so you were roughly following the sort of um, uh, 
uh, shape you expect broadly, and you see, you know, 50% efficiency near five sigma, which is about what you'd expect. Uh, I would say though that there definitely are some bumps and wiggles here that are a little bit. Um, I mean, you can can look at the error bars and think about whether you 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 think that matches the curve or not. But I think there's certainly um, some details here that are worth digging into and understanding. And in particular, I would have expected we'd have more completeness at the highest signal to noise end than, than uh, is apparent in this plot in particular. So, um, you know, this may be, uh, you know, sort of a denominator effect where some of these injected fakes are falling onto mask regions that aren't actually accessible to difference imaging, um, but we need to make sure we've got the, the bookkeeping right. And the way to do that is, you know, drill in at the individual source level. So, um, We've got these tools uh, and 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 just need to to make fuller use of them. Um, there is also a again from the DRP team a new source injection framework that they are using, particularly even with uh, injecting galaxies, as you see in the perhaps blinking image on the right. Um, so we are taking uh, the source injection, the fake injection code that we have been using, and and making sure we're sharing as much code as possible. Uh, across science pipelines. Um, one activity that I think we want to give uh, some more attention to uh, is thinking about how we inject sources. I mean, we can just obviously sprinkle uh, fake PSFs all over the image, but uh, ultimately we want to understand uh, how difference imaging performs uh, in resolved galaxies and, um, you know, in different sort of environments. And so, um, you know, thinking a little more strategically about how to use those um, uh, source catalogs, I think will be quite quite important. Um, I'm thinking in particular about what we can do, uh, perhaps even in prompt processing after the alerts are sent uh, and the 60 second timer has stopped. Um, we would still like to be able to characterize uh, the efficiency of the image we just processed. And so perhaps using sort of an afterburner, we can get some metrics from that. Uh, process uh, even in production. All right, I'm going to keep moving uh, and talk about uh, machine learning reliability scoring, uh, sometimes also called real bogus or spuriousness. Uh, again, the idea is that uh, once you uh, have a have a difference image source, idea source, uh, we know there are plenty of artifacts, and so. Uh, we apply uh, a machine learning score to uh, try to tell us how likely it is that the source is astrophysical or not. Uh, we have a couple of point requirements evaluated a signal to noise of six uh, for completeness and purity uh, for uh, transient and as well as uh, moving object science. And so those are the requirements uh, that we're trying to hit. Um, we are right now focusing on kind of a traditional uh, real bogus classifier, uh, in this case, using deep learning. Uh, there's a long uh, history here in the astrophysical li literature of increasing sophistication. Um, you know, you feed in the cutouts of your source into uh, this black box and get a score out. Uh, and so we have indeed implemented uh, something like this. Um, Sorry, my slides are in a different order than I thought. Um, so we have this, we, we've, we've trained a model, we have it integrated into science pipelines so it can provide scores. Uh, and as advertised, we're thinking about how then to generate appropriate metrics uh, that we can feed out automatically of pipelines and uh, use that to hone in on problems and identify uh, bad subtractions and so on. Um, here is uh, a completeness uh, purity curve or precision recall, if you prefer. Uh, this is a model that is trained on uh, a subset of the DC2 data. Uh, you see the confusion matrix in the middle. The two gold stars are uh, just in PowerPoint, so they may not be exactly positioned correctly, but um, a rough idea of where those two point requirements are. We are near the required performance uh, for this classifier. Again, it's trained on simulated data. So in some sense, it's a little bit easier uh, than, than we expect in reality, but it is a starting point. Uh, and you can see on the right that uh, the true positives and true negatives uh, look uh, about like you'd expect. Uh, Will, yes, I see your hand. Yeah, sorry, just to understand, in your figure to the left of purity versus completeness, um, oh. do I understand correctly that, that one percent on both figures would mean 99 percent 
purity and 99% of recall. Sorry, so the yes, yeah. one, one one is one is a hundred percent exactly. Yeah, it's fractional rather than rather. Oh, one is a hundred percent. Okay, thank yeah. you. So it, yeah, sure the, you uh, yes, you're correct. The the oh. axes are mislabeled. You're right. Um, I see Meg's hand is up. It just had a question about real bogus, I guess, also as well as detection. There's been concern that comets are different than galaxies yeah. in terms of their profile. Image sim doesn't do it. There's concern that, you know, at that thousand square degrees, you're not going to find a faint comet and a bright comet to test on. Are yep. there thoughts about how you're, the real bogus is going to get tested on this, as well as the other part of sort of the detection of, of those? Yeah, great question. And I think it certainly applies to comments. It also applies to, you know, trailed, trailed sources as well, uh, you know, near the asteroids and so on. Um, I, I, we certainly have, uh, ideas, um, you know, it's probably some combination of, um, you know, finding real examples, but, but, but probably we, we would supplement training and testing with, um, um, and with some, you know, if we can generate these synthetically and inject them into, into, into data, you can use that. It's, it's not, it's not as good as using, uh, you know, label real examples, but you you can still uh, use those to train the classifiers. So uh, this is definitely something that uh, I would say we're aware of and thinking about. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I don't have a, a much clearer example or a, a statement for you uh, at the moment, but um, it's it's certainly on our mind. So is this something that like for a commissioning test would be possible? Because the concern is that CAM is not LSST CAM. Yep. And so is that, do you think that's possible or something that could be done in commissioning? Because it wouldn't take long, right? It would just be two quick snaps of a bright and a faint comet. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's a question for the, to some extent, it's a question for like the, you know, folks planning the commissioning observations who are trying to multiplex all, you know, all the different things we need to, to, to verify and validate. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, that's something that, you know, I, th I think would come would 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 come through some of the commissioning science units in particular to, you know, think about tests to run. Uh, you know, looking at um, you know sort sources that are not PSF like but are are indeed transient or variable. All right, let me keep moving. Um, so I, the model I just showed you was trained on DC2. That's simulated data, which is nice because you have the absolute truth, but uh, of course it's not real data. How do we get from there to here? I think it's uh, here to there. Um, I think there are a few uh, avenues that we're, uh, I think, kind of pursue, pursuing in parallel. Uh, one is, I think, obviously there is a uh, aspect of human labeling that is necessary. And so we have, uh, a Zooniverse project that is um, sort of waiting, waiting to press the green light uh, or, or to, to, to press the go button to, to start. Uh, we're just sort of getting our strategy sorted on how best to use that. Um, but I think we're also going to explore uh, use of domain adaptation to take the DC2 uh, model weights and uh, you know um, adjust and apply those to real data and then refine them with active learning. Um, this is a, a little bit of a research project, but you know we know that uh, as the pipelines uh, continue to change, we're going to need to keep the models updated and retrained uh, throughout, frankly, the lifetime of the whole survey. Uh, and so um, this is a you know an, an ongoing project rather than something that you know we'll say is is done on a certain day and never to be touched again. All right, uh, crowded field processing. Um, we have a data set that we've defined uh, from DECAM that we use to test uh, crowded field performance. Uh, it was uh, a couple of uh, subset of a set of fields observed uh, by Avi Saha, uh, looking for our library and other variables. Uh, and so we picked uh, a subset of these in G and I bands um, and uh, have those sort of available in the USDF. Um, our last major processing of that was in 2020. It's described in a tech node DMT in 171, if you're curious. Um, and the major conclusions I would say uh, from, from that run 
Uh, we identified a number of pipeline configuration changes that we needed to uh, successfully you know, make it through the pipelines. Um, there is some in the bottom right, you see some sort of renderings of the model PSF. Uh, they're definitely, you know, because the ability to determine that a PSF is certainly a concern in the most crowded fields and our pipelines at present uh, still want you to find it. Um, I think it was a reasonable inference of the PSF, even in these crowded fields. Uh, and in the left, you see that we were able to successfully process um, uh, images as crowded up as as crowded as uh, you know six hundred thousand sources per square degree, which is uh, which is quite dense. Um, we did not get back to this data until uh, recently, and actually, we have just concluded a new reprocessing of this data um, after you know migrating from Gen two to Gen three middleware and changing data centers and on and on and on. Um, we have now reprocessed this data again, thankfully. Uh, we've got about 95% of the images that have successfully finished processing. Uh, it's not as the same as saying they have good image differences. Uh, bottom uh, right shows a um, cutout of the image. Uh, you certainly see in dense fields, you have more bright saturated stars, but there's also, I think, more residual structure that I don't uh, really believe. And so I think we have some more work here to drill in. So um, we need to understand why the why the images that failed failed and see if we can uh, recover them if they are recoverable. Um, but uh, you know again here, I think we want to use our uh, injection tools uh, and our fact identification to help us uh, make sure the pipeline is is tuned. Uh, the other concern here about the crowded field is is um, execution time. Uh, just the sheer number of sources uh, tends to make it slower. And so, uh, in the 2020 processing, we saw some quite long outliers in terms of processing time. We have to make sure that we're we're fast as we can be. Robert, did you have a question? No. All right. Um, let me briefly comment on uh, how we're using Oxtel. Um, alert production in production runs under prompt processing. Uh, this allows us to be uh, driven, event driven. Uh, and preload data to meet our uh, latency bu budget. Uh, so we have a specialized um, execution uh, environment that we have uh, uh, been developing over the last year or so, uh, and that is now in production. I can tell you more about it if you're interested. Uh, but the point is that we're now running, uh, every time Oxtel takes images, we're running from processing and alert production. Uh, and you know, producing different images out of the out of the image uh, out of the those data, um, you know, we're finding operational issues and fixing them. Uh, we have not yet really started digging into the uh, science output products, uh, and and that is sort of a, a near term task uh, to actually make sure that they're producing you know decent difference images. There's still, frankly, a, a laundry list here, which I won't talk through, but we, we've got a lot of technical pieces uh, still to do in terms of integration tasks, which is, again, uh, the, the sort of the first priority of why we're using Oxtel uh, to prepare so that when ComCam goes on, uh, we, we have worked out these issues. Um, but uh, again, this has proven a, a really useful and valuable um, sort of motivating force to, to uh, get us into the right operational mindset. All right, uh, very briefly to close, I wanted to say a couple words about the commissioning science unit. There are actually two of them. Um, I am the head of the, um, I'm the head of the DIA transients group and Mario is the head of the DIA solar system group. Uh, and so these are mostly, um, let me skip slides here. These are mostly uh, folks from uh, the science collaborations. We got a lot of desk folks, uh, Graham and some others from Strong Lensing are there. Uh, and so they, Sped uh, is here as well, of course. Uh, and so these folks are bringing their um, extensive expertise and scientific knowledge uh, to help us uh, get through the commissioning period. And so the, the tasks at hand are to, um, make sure that we are thinking appropriately about how to interpret our requirements and, and ensure we've met them, generate 
um, you know, really good metrics and, and plots um, and help sort of validate the, the whole system. Um, and so um, we have a set of assigned requirements, high level requirements in the LSR and the OSS um, that we are responsible for, uh, for validating uh, or for or providing guidance to systems engineering on how to validate. And so we are beginning those discussions. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're getting folks up to speed uh, using the pipelines, testing uh, DA performance in particular uh, around galaxy clusters. Um, you know, this is, I think, a great example of um, how having, having some scientists with some specific expertise allows us to leverage and extend what you know, the project AP group can do. Um, Michael Wabese and his student Xu Lu are doing some nice work on DIA algorithms uh, and configuration. Uh, and so there's a great deal more for us uh, in, the, in the weeks ahead as we uh, get ready for ComCam. So um, I will close there and we have a couple of minutes, I guess, for questions. Um, I think the the take home message is, you know, we all understand that DIA is is critical to to Rubin science and in particularly the time domain and real time science. Um, you know, we are uh, building and extending our tools to uh, let us improve our pipelines, uh, but there's uh, candidly still quite a bit to do, and so uh, it's going to be a busy couple of years. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. That was great. I really appreciate the update. Thank you for, for fitting it into what turned out to be a somewhat shortened uh, time frame as well. Um, I appreciate your flexibility. Um, so we're at about two minutes to the end of the hour, uh, which I think is a good hard stop for the meeting. Um, so I'm going to encourage that um, I'm going to encourage us to uh, write any questions we have after Eric's presentation into the uh, agenda live notes document um, um, and then we can we can go from there um, just a quick announcement before we do uh, finish the meeting um, in, a, in a day or so I'll be sending out a poll to find out if we can find a time for these for future meetings uh, that, that are more it's more friendly for those not on Pacific time zones so please keep an eye out for that and we'll use that to help schedule uh, the next one of these meetings. Um, I think that's all I have for this week. Um, we have time. No, we don't. We've got one minute left of the hour. So thank you very much, everyone. Let's all thank Eric again and Jelko and, um, and Aaron for their presentations. And thanks to Leanne for helping uh, with taking the notes. Um, so thank you, Eric. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now from the meeting, but those who are available, um, if you have questions that can be dealt with quickly, we can we can do those too. Um, so thank you all very much for your time. I know everyone's busy. Uh, I will stop recording and um, have a happy week, everybody. So stop recording.